Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. This is Evan Troxel. In this episode, I welcome Jaffe Walton to the podcast. Jaffe is an application specialist at McNeil & Associates. And at McNeil, Jaffe uses his wide range of AEC experiences of over 25 years to help users navigate the uncharted waters of cross-platform integrations. In this episode, we discuss his journey in AEC and how that plays a role at what he does at McNeil, the ongoing development of Grasshopper and Rhino Inside Revit, which is the meat of this conversation, the evolution of their relationship with Autodesk, the importance of user input and feedback, the improvements in tools for architects coming in the upcoming Rhino version 8 release, and other topics. And so without further ado, I bring you my wide-ranging conversation with Jaffe Walton. Jaffe, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Thank you. This is going to be a fun conversation because uh, I, I like talking about Trojan horses and and <laughs> you got McNeil team has built kind of what I would consider the ultimate Trojan horse here with with Rhino inside. But before we get to Rhino inside Revit, uh, let's talk about you and, and how you've your, your career progression to get to this point and what you're working on now. Yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll try to keep it kind of short, but uh, it's pretty relevant to the work I do with Rhino inside Revit. I kind of went to the, I guess you call it the school of hard knocks for CAN. Uh, I initially started in the nineties, uh, for a friend of mine's company called CADCO, which is, uh, CAD consultants, which at the time was doing mostly like AutoCAD microstation red lines for various firms. And so that kind of, that quickly got me up to the speed and doing, uh, working in different standards, implementing each firm's standards and like switching back and forth between softwares on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, and the, the next step of that was kind of, uh, going from that 2d world into, uh, architectural desktop, which was a uh, pretty efficient object modeling where instead of putting the lines in, we're adding doors, making walls and uh, get it ended up getting pretty proficient. Uh, they had some great curtain walls and uh, it was sort of like Revit, but uh, as soon as Revit came along, uh, I thought for sure that like Autodesk was fully behind their product of architectural desktop. And uh, as we know now, I was horribly wrong and uh, soon saw the error of my ways and uh, started working exclusively in Revit and uh, Around that time, I kind of made some changes in my life, uh, moved states, uh, where I currently reside in Minnesota, and started working at uh, various architecture firms. Uh, started with a, a small firm in St. Cloud, Minnesota, where we we're doing pretty decent projects, multifamily, uh, uh, stadium, local stadium, things like that. Uh, but then I uh, ended up getting poached by a former CADCO client, which was uh, medical architecture. So they, they were doing emergency departments, programming, stuff like that. Um, I worked with uh, kind of one of the a salesman architect where we would go to various locations, uh, like at the University of Wisconsin, we'd go to their design a new emergency department, a uh, little charrette. And my job was to kind of help with the programming and then kind of create a, a 3D model in Revit that uh, I would render in Max and have a little presentation at the end of the week. Mm. Um, that worked out for a few years. It was an amazing, amazing experience. I actually got to go to India. They had an India office. I uh, got to train uh, their users there in Revit. Um, still probably, uh, I guess, one of my core memories. It's a wonderful time. Mm. Uh, from there, um, I ended up having some children and staying at home and uh, doing some uh, back to kind of the contracting work. Uh, ended up taking a, a project at Ellerbury Beckett, which is now part of AECCOM, where we worked on uh, the Sidra Medical Campus in Qatar, uh, our first big metric project, mm -hmm. um, which is incredible experience. Uh, that was still working in 32-bit uh, Revit, so I had to print out the entire set every single week and send it to Qatar. 
thousands wow. of project or thousands of pages. So uh, it was like in with a 32 bit, you could only uh, print out so many at a time before you had to restart the computer. Uh, <laughs> oh, lots man. of fun. Uh, but kind of with the downturn, I think it was probably what 2010. Um, I was hired by McGrath, which is a architectural uh, metal panel uh, fabricator and installer. So this was my first kind of getting into um, the actual things that are actually being built. We're working in at an architecture firm. A lot of the times you, you end up working on like 10% that might get built in a few years. So this was a definitely a different, uh, different pace. Yeah. And there's a lot different, um, architecture firm, you're, you're pretty much working in the system they have, whereas construction firm, it's going to give, they have a lot more margins and leeway and willingness to take risks to mm -hmm. um, make the productivity get a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I was kind of first introduced to Rhino and Katia. And uh, so like my, my first Rhino experience was working on a, a, a spiral staircase where, uh, we were getting the scans in doing it. It was like a million dollar staircase where we were trying to, to get the curved glass, the, the metal panels, the, uh, all the trim and everything. Um, and the architect had done it in, uh, had designed it in Rhino where they were using, uh, just like made the curves, did some sweeps. So after about like three months of that, uh, I got the project done, but it was extremely, extremely painful. And my boss uh, asked me for a recommendation on Rhino. And um, yeah, I kind of, I, I, I didn't give it a good recommendation because it wasn't parametric. Uh, <laughs> I right. had to redraw everything every time, I had to unfold mm. it. Mm. And it was just uh, kind of back to Revit I went. Uh, so as that went along, uh, we ended up doing a project, uh, the MGM Casino at National Harbor, where we uh, were coming in replacing the metal panel contractor at the last minute. So we had three months to verify the existing conditions, create over 5,000 panels, and um, get those installed. So this was a breakneck uh, pace, and we had to... Uh, so I was really fortunate there because a lot of my coworkers were architectural graduates. Uh, they were more the, the kind of the dorky kind that uh, uh, didn't fit in so well in an architecture firm. So they, they were in the construction industry hmm. and uh, they knew Grasshopper. And we, they came up with um, an unfold script uh, and that I was able to work in and get those in Grasshopper and get those panels done just out of pure necessity. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Once that project was done, I was kind of bitten by the grasshopper bug and I, and I kind of felt like I could uh, make the script better. And so I, I just kind of, I, I kept going with it. And fortunately I was in that situation where I had that leeway um, to kind of to take that deep dive in the grasshopper and uh, and try to make it work. So that was just several years of learning grasshopper and, uh, uh, working in, uh, panelization. So it's, it's kind of a little different take than like a computational design mm -hmm. where, where they're coming up with those forms. I'm actually trying, I was trying to make the, uh, those forms reality yeah. and using, um, more of a, computational drafter situation it's more like deconstruction rather than than form making right it's like yeah take, taking it down to back to the essentials and kind of rebuilding it so that it's fabricatable is a completely different design problem oh uh, yeah and it's yeah and it gets just it gets very complex uh with the materials and uh, and and trying to verify uh the reality of the of what's happening in the on a construction site with what you've uh, received from models from architects. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's quite a challenge. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, architects like, don't know a lot about material tolerances, right? And, and no. if, if you're working in 
jip board versus metal panels. Those are two different worlds when it comes to tolerances. And that's not something that a design intent model addresses in any shape or form. And that's where the shop drawing process comes into play. And in, and in what you're saying is it, it, it's, it's, it's even a much higher level than that because you're building scripts to deconstruct and reconstruct and build the tolerances in so that the machines can cut or weld or do whatever that the, you're going to be doing on the manufacturing process. Yeah. And this, and like I said, it gives you a, a, in that construction, there's the margins are huge. Like in the people that you're serving are, are the, um, these union labor in the shop, union, union labor in the field. So, mm. Uh, if they're working overtime and you have mm -hmm. 50 people on site, it's, it's it big dollars. costs a lot of money. So yeah. um, that's where you're actually given the freedom to, to use these different softwares um, mm -hmm. to, to get the job done. Whereas uh, in an architecture firm, they, they're just kind of, you're billing hours, you're, mm -hmm. you're working in the system. So that, that's, I feel very fortunate to have, ended up in a place where, where I could actually kind of go into that rabbit hole mm -hmm. where, and granted taking that, taking that step, uh, means I got, I got to make it work, which meant, uh, sometimes fighting data trees for 18 hours a day. <laughs> right. I, I didn't exactly know what I was doing. Uh, -huh. uh crash course and, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So, man, I you, you've said so many pieces of software titles there that I remember kind of fondly, I guess, but kind of not, right? I mean, it, it's been a, a crazy progression over the last 25 years, but I I learned MicroStation too, like back in the day, and they had to transition to architectural desktop. And it was like, wow, you can actually place doors. You don't have to draw doors anymore. And and the curtain walls and things like that. And, and then when Revit came out, I, yeah, I changed the game once again. Um, so it's, it's been a, a similar road for me as well, but never to the level that you're talking about where you're actually doing the fabrication level modeling and deconstruction. I've done a little bit of that, but it was never parametric in any way. It was, I, I worked in an interior, uh, retail shop where we did design to fabrication and we were using form Z and I grew up on form Z because of it being a solid modeler. That was very much kind of in line with my architectural brain and the surface modeling of early Rhino and even SketchUp uh, was just like, this doesn't work for me, right? It, I always had to stay, and I always had this thing in my mind that solids were always better than surfaces. And, and that's because I didn't come from an in industrial design background. I came from an architectural background. And even then I didn't come from a parametric architectural background. I was very much a modernism, postmodernism, uh, you know, streamline modern and international style architecture education. So I just kind of, I think I slot in a little differently than a lot of people out there nowadays where it's like grasshopper is part of the curriculum, um, right? Rhino is a viewer for grasshopper <laughs> for more, more often than anything. And now the work that you're doing is even putting all of that inside of Revit to kind of bridge the gap between design intent and construction documentation and, and maybe I mean, you know more than I do about actually getting to fabrication level uh, drawings. Yeah. So yeah. there's, uh, yeah, that's where working in the, the architecture, like, yeah, I didn't have any understanding of the, the, the nerves, curves and the surfaces uh, that like how that all that was built. And that's where I kind of struggled at the beginning in uh, Rhino. And then I ended up becoming a grasshopper user where I kind of back learned in the Rhino, I, I learned the Rhino commands from using Grasshopper, like yeah. Orient, <laughs> three point and stuff. There was, right. um, I, I learned it backwards. And in that process, um, but there's always that last 5% of the project, even in a Revit project, you know, it's like you're trying to document in Revit and it's that last, that 10% or it's like the, there's something you're trying to do that just Revit's not going to quite get you there this much. Mm -hmm. And like when you're in fabrication, you got to take it to that hundred percent and there's not too many softwares can do it. That's where that company was actually, we got heavily involved in Katia mm -hmm. uh, as well. But for me, uh, using Rhino where it's unconstrained, 
where I could kind of get in there and manually change something in the last, that last little bit to address that 5% that's uh, got to get done somehow. But in Katia, where I don't know how familiar with that, but it's a very Not structured, yeah. uh, very structured. So it's, it's a like, kind of like SolidWorks where it's like a parametric modeler where you're assigning true parametric, uh, the, the radius of a, a sphere that or some part that changes, that'll change the parts around it, mm -hmm. chain it together. So it's all locked in. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Rhino, it's not parametric. So you can actually right. at the last minute, just go change a couple things. And so that ended up being really, really good for the, that fabrication type work. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the whole idea of designing by constraints, like the Katia model and, and parent and child relationships between objects and the way that those mm -hmm. things kind of ripple downward. I mean, that's, that is the idea also with grasshopper, right? Is that you can, you can make a change it, then it keeps it parametric all the way through the chain, through the tree, through all the, and it recomputes the whole thing, but it's a, totally different approach. And I think it's really interesting that you said that you learned Rhino by going backwards, by learning Grasshopper first. I, I, I understood the concepts of Rhino because of the modeling that I had done before, but all the commands were different. They all have different names. Um, there's no wall tool in Rhino. There's no, definitely no parametric kind of wall tool like I was used to using, or even, even from something like Revit, right? Um, but learning how to build a wall tool in Grasshopper led me down the path of learning how to build ge geometry walls in Rhino. And, and so it, I think it's similar. And, and I appreciate that you said it that way because I've never really thought about it that way, but it is kind of the path that I took as well. It was like, I need to write these cool tools for Rhino because maybe they don't exist in Rhino. But then by doing that, you also learn Rhino. So I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh... Uh, so how I kind of ended up with McNeil in that situation. Uh, so I, I was with M McGrath for like 11 years mm -hmm. and went through the pandemic, got to the end of it. And uh, yeah, it just wasn't feeling working with the company anymore. Things had changed, uh, which like I said, amazing experience. They worked on all these huge monolithic projects, worked on Geary projects and Diller Scofidia and like all these panelizations, really incredible experience. But it was time for a change. So I, I, uh, I started doing some contracting again, working from home. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Davidson reached out to me, uh, with a, a paneling plugin, uh, for, uh, for facades. I was like, well, I'm kind of, kind of out of that right now. And, um, yeah, just kind of doing my own thing. And he's like, well, why don't you come, come work with us. So, um, did, uh, some, uh, six months trial, just, um, see what the, the situation was. And, yeah, uh, it's, it, I'm very fortunate. And, uh, that's how, that's how I ended up at McNeil. Wow. Um, how long have you been there now? Uh, about two years. And, okay. And a lot of that. So when I was learning all the grasshopper things, it was going in, uh, a lot of that was answer, fi figuring out the problems I had. And then also, going on the, the Rhino forum and just helping people, trying to answer questions, uh, trying to figure out their problems. And uh, that's how I learned everything. And then the uh, there's all, yeah, it's such a great community. And it mm -hmm. was kind of like, I felt rewarded by it. So I wanted to pay it back. So it was always helpful. So the, I think I uh, kind of gives a little lesson. It's like, being nice to people on the internet might not be a bad thing. You never know what <laughs> might happen. You know, it's, I echo that. I mean, the, the Rhino forums are a great place. There's definitely some characters in there as well. But uh, overall, I mean, it is a really constructive place to learn ways to do things, right? Because there's always more than one way to do things. And what's interesting to me is, is it, it's kind of like a GitHub where it's like someone will take the original posters file, right? If it's grasshopper, or rhino, whatever, and they'll do a thing to it and somebody else will do it a different way, but they'll post their results too. And then usually the, the original person ends up picking and choosing pieces out of all of them. And, but everybody learns by watching that unfold. And I think that is such a cool thing about the rhino community, the forum online is it is a, 
and is really active. I, I just like going back there and and just reading through the new updates and reading through the threads because even if it has nothing to do with architecture, like if it's somebody learning how to build a car with subdivision surfaces, I, I'll still learn something about the tools that I can then apply back to my domain. And I think that that's just a fascinating wonderful way to learn how to use a tool and, to do something and it is a community where there's kind of an ebb and flow of people going in and out you know mm -hmm. back when i first got into it like andrew human was mm -hmm. still really active but mm -hmm. uh it was kind of the same i think it was kind of the same situation he started out as a grasshopper user ended up learning how to code ended up learning how to build plugins ended up helping the the whole community as a whole just yeah. on his own as a as a member of that community and that's right. where that's, uh, and he's still around, but he's kind of doing his own thing. He did the WeWork and, uh, uh, yeah. So you have all these, all these veterans and then you have these new people that come in and you could tell they have the same attitude and, uh, uh it's, it's great, great place to be. So. Something that comes up, a theme that comes up a lot on the podcast is like these aha moments where that people have. And in this case, you know, when people see what, what grasshopper could maybe do, it's like, I got to figure, I got to, I have to look at this, right? And that's what you see a lot of new users start up and they, it, in the forum and they post something like, how do I make this work? Because this is my first project in Grasshopper, right? And, and that just kind of lights a fire that is really fun to watch people and you it, know, build it on top of that. Like, just like anything, it's um, like a progressive refinement of your, of your workflows, um, the first time you do anything, it's going to be a rough draft. So it's yeah. like uh, kind of watching how other people make really simple definitions. One of my, my favorite users is HS Kim, this Korean architect who mm -hmm. just makes these gorgeous, simple E equals MC squared type grasshopper definitions that are just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those are the kind of, yeah, like you get to that from a big spaghetti uh, that can actually be done in just like this little, this little couple of snippets. And then, yeah, oh, that's, that, cool. that's where it really, it really gets good. So how now tell the story of, of kind of bridging the gap now between your grasshopper use as a, as a really kind of dedicated technician of grasshopper, I would assume. And then, Rhino inside, you know, so that we have Grasshopper inside Rhino inside a Revit. How, how did that, because obviously, you know, Revit, you know, Grasshopper, you know, Rhino at this point, And now all of these worlds converge in the last few years and building out a, an incredible tool set. So maybe you can kind of take us through, through how all that happened. Yeah. So, I mean, I was definitely an early adopter um, as, as soon as it came out, because um, as a user and that's where, um, I was active on the forum right away. Um, so I like the development was, uh, Scott David set there, that development team, Kike and Asan, uh, creator of Pi Revit, um, uh, initially, uh, so getting into there, uh, like right away when I, I learned, I, I learned quickly, like, cause we still don't have like curtain wall components, like um, mm -hmm. some like a curtain grid, for instance. So I was like, oh, I'm joining the team. I can get everything I want. You know, it's like I can get the, <laughs> uh, still two years later, we don't have a curtain curtain wall component um, because the development of soft, like the development and the actual uh, user expectations, uh, some they, they take a while. So they, the, mm -hmm. there's its own kind of progressive refinement that the, the people developing need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it was learning more the Revit API because you like to be able to work in Rhino inside Revit, you're, you're in the grasshopper environment, but it's essentially doing Revit API calls uh, where Yes, you don't have to know coding to do it, but you still have to understand how Revit works, how Grasshopper works, mm -hmm. um, maybe even how like uh, referencing things from Rhino. So it's it's the combination of 
uh, all those where you're creating a particular workflow uh, that works for the users. So having people come with the, with the, the questions uh, that generate the, the new components that, that create the, uh, the workflow that is going to be hopefully ap apl applicable to other people's as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's kind of where it's, um, how it's grown is, uh, is these user inputs. Uh, and then, like I said, sometimes even something that might seem simple from a user standpoint, it's like, I just want to be able to place a grid, grid point with our element tracking. And, uh, um, that's a little more difficult when it, there's, uh, multiple layers going on underneath of, of trying to, cause there is still a, a little bit of an interface of that grasshopper puts in that's different than like a dynamo mm -hmm. like interaction with Revit. So there's, um, that, that element tracking and everything. So everything has to work within the, the Revit environment and also that grasshopper user environment. So, yeah. So. It's interesting to think about how much of a power user you kind of need to be. And this really is a tool set for really technical users, right? This is not a, a tool set for like, like my, my wife uses Revit all the time. She would never even think about opening Dynamo, let alone installing Rhino inside and getting into Grasshopper, right? Um, there, I think we all know users who like, you mentioned Andrew Human and Human UI, where it actually pulled some of the Grasshopper interface back into Rhino because they were never going to open Grasshopper, right? And and so mm -hmm. even on the Rhino side, obviously there's a, a whole spectrum of users that are going to use the software. Where you get the you talked about the dorky, you know, the nerdy folks, like they're the ones who are in Grasshopper. They they can it's like the Matrix. They can see the the graph and and they can kind of understand what it's going to do. And there's the other ones who are like, no, I literally need to see the model because I only speak in, in pictures. I don't speak in code or visual programming. This Rhino inside Revit takes that to another level, right? It's like you are running multiple layers deep of UI to flow data from one place to another. And like you said, you might even be flowing it from Rhino into Grasshopper and then back into, into Revit. Uh, referencing it grasshopper and then pushing that out into revit as revit native elements and that that gets complicated fast right so yeah yeah i can i can imagine but at the same time it's like you're you're making it so that elements don't have to be modeled again inside a revit i mean i i guess maybe you can just take a step back with with the whole goal of rhino inside revit and just talk about it from from that before we we dive deeper into any of these subjects because there's, there's a lot of things you can't do in Revit. I assume that's really the reason why people really push for the development of this. Um, and obviously, knowing a tool like Rhino and not having to figure out other weird ways of doing things in Revit as workarounds or whatever to create the geometry you want. If you already know a tool, it'd be great if I could just bring that stuff in. And forever, interoperability has been on the table as like, one of the highest things that people want when it comes to these tools and that never happened. And now you, you've built this tool to actually put those models directly inside, put the modeling application directly inside the other application, let alone the, the models themselves. Yeah. I mean, and well, initially the Rhino inside and Rhino inside Revit started out with, I think they were just seeing if they could do it, you know, mm -hmm. kind of as a lark, you know, <laughs> that's like, look at us. Um, but it's incredibly useful. So that's the goal is to be able to, yeah, to make that a tool, uh, where, and then McNeil thought it was neat enough that they would actually pick up the, the, the building of those components. Whereas mm -hmm. we have Rhino inside Tecla, which Tecla's their internal department has done their, their implementation and which is okay. an incredible thing. And it's different than Rhino inside Revit. It's mm -hmm. not, yeah, it works totally different. So, yeah, we're very, very limited by the Rhino API, how to interact, how that's it's a transactional database. So, like, yeah, you're you're kind of phasing in and out between being an active in Revit and being active in Grasshopper. So it's it's definitely uh, more complex from that 
that standpoint as uh, as a, a tool building platform. Um, but that's where we want to uh, continue to go is it's it's going to be user driven. And one of the, the big asks right now is is that kind of UI for simpler um, simpler interaction. So where a person, a, a higher level person can develop their grasshopper script, have that human UI component or something similar where they can, the user say, pick your rabbit elements, pick your walls, blink, 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 and do something. Uh, so that that's definitely going to be a, um, a part of the future coming up. Uh, one of the one of the things that Asan brings to the table, because you'll notice that like, okay, right on side rabbit's not really like my rabbit at all. All right, there's a UI and it doesn't like, it doesn't um, work like that. But now Asan has actually been working in the new GH1 types that are uh, coming to Grasshopper that are, uh, so he's actually working on this, uh, the script editor that will kind of tie a lot of these things together and hopefully get more um, kind of modular, kind of asonified, I guess, where it's more like PyRevit, where you can um, you can create your own tools that are going to be able to distribute to other people, hmm. uh, things like that, as nice. we're also just still kind of adding in um, additional components for uh, like electrical MEP type components, the curtain wall stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just kind of keeping up with the users. Uh, a lot of our users are these big projects. They're they're working on massive, uh, either for whatever reason they're working in gigabyte uh, size Revit projects, either either because there's a lot of geometry or uh, just because they're massive. So that's where uh, having like some, like the, the, the variety of users is incredible because mm -hmm. it, it could be from somebody that's working in an, uh, just doing electrical drawings to uh, like a fosters and partner that wants to take like Rhino geometry and bring it in. So into Revit um, quickly. So that, I mean, that's, it's all over the board of what people are asking for. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can only imagine what that's like, because even just thinking about Revit, you could have a, an architect doing single family residential, something very small to the most massive projects, right? Where you've got lots of models all coordinated via the cloud and lots of different consultants playing in there. And, oh uh, man, it's, it gets complicated fast. Um, I'm curious what you what your guys' stance is on Dynamo, since I assume there's a lot of crossover, but then there's also kind of complementary tools. Obviously, Dynamo has hooks into into everything. Do you have as many hooks into everything as Dynamo does? Uh, like, what what's your view on that whole side of it? Because we haven't talked about Dynamo too much. The the, the Dynamo, I've, I've I haven't spent a lot of time in. I did a couple like keynote kind of things with Dynamo at one point back when I was working with McGrath, um, I, a lot of people are kind of crossover users. Um, and so I do hear about their issues with dynamo, the DLL hell that they go through. Mm. Um, and I've seen a lot of really positive things as far as how they, they're getting, they're answering that question of like, I want to be able to just share my scripts, which where Dynamo includes different packages, dependencies. Right. right. Uh, and they're getting better with that, where you can kind of package them up and have a, and a little UI uh, that shows up and they just push a couple buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bottom line is you still have to have a, a power Dynamo user mm -hmm. that has full understanding of what's going on in Revit and that can make those tools and get them out there. But yeah, that's... Uh, I think any of these workflows, uh, I'm, I'm just a big fan of the, the graphical interface, the, the graphical programming. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not, I, I like, I, I was thinking about this the other day is whether, whether if Grasshopper really hadn't came out, 
because the grasshopper one it's been out a while um and it was yeah it was just kind of a development platform they didn't really know what was going to happen with it so it's right it's not like you pay extra for grasshopper you never have never right. never will where and that kind of kick-started it wasn't the first graphical program like thing like that but what would have what would have happened if that if grasshopper wasn't around you know would, would a dynamo even came about hmm. uh would have been a like a something different than it is now because it is still like a separate from autodesk as far as um it's an open source thing mm -hmm. which is great um but yeah i kind of wonder what would have happened if grasshopper wasn't around like would dino dynamo even be a thing i don't know we'll have to ask ian ian the father of dynamo and see see what yeah. what his answer is to that <laughs> yeah that's cool so You've mentioned Rhino Inside Tecla. What else is Rhino Inside used in as far as other host applications? Well, those those are the big ones. Um, there's a lot of kind of examples out there. There's Rhino, in, Rhino Inside AutoCAD, but that's going to be up to um, somebody else to, to kind of take the ball and run with. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been a Rhino Inside Bentley couple attempts on that um where there so i as far as big applications i i, I think we're i think we're in enough of them uh but it, it's gonna be where we don't know those apis so mm -hmm. it's like we've kind of we're diving in and into a situation where we've gotten into the rabbit one where we where you had to but ideally it's gonna be developed by the people who know the program, uh, who know the workflows. Uh, and that's where, uh, that's kind of been the, what McNeil does is it's a development platform. That's mm -hmm. where the Grasshopper has um, started out really basic and it, everybody built upon it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that's not in Grasshopper. There's, uh, there's no access to blocks. There's no, um, a lot of fundamental Rhino stuff isn't in Grasshopper. All that was kind of added in by people's workflows. Mm -hmm. uh, that's changing now a little bit. So we're, and, uh, we're adding that stuff into that uh, next version of Rhino. The Rhino 8 has that, all the new Grasshopper 1 data types. What? it's still up to people with their knowledge of the software knowledge of the workflows to, to come up with the new Rhino inside implementations. I think I've seen something about Rhino inside Excel and Rhino inside illustrator. And, and those were maybe, I don't know, proof of concept or, or maybe they're being developed. I think it's fascinating to apply it to completely different models, you know, me like mental models, I guess what I'm thinking of when, it's like manipulating data inside, you know, a spreadsheet from Rhino through, via Grasshopper or whatever. And, and also in Illustrator, using it to draw things that turn into two-dimensional illustration, you know, Bezier curves and, and whatnot. That's pretty fascinating. It just opens a door to people if they're already familiar with this powerful tool, Grasshopper, that they can leverage that understanding to manipulate data, whether it's lines or actual you know numbers in another program i think is just super interesting it brings a completely different perspective to those programs yeah it really does uh and it and i think the illustrator is going to get some traction for sure because mm. i mean there are a lot of illustrator users and having that that interaction is is going to be um, really good like i said i think yeah the xl uh is probably probably just going to sit there as an example I don't, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's new stuff. I think they just added Python into Excel. So there's going to be, once you start getting these ability to <laughs> where those programs are starting to say, Hey, we can, we can send this info and talk to each other a little bit on an outside program. The more that happens, the better. Uh, and that's kind of take, kind of going back to what Asan's come up with. That's, I mean, we're going to, we're going to have uh, Python three, uh, and then be able to 
like, yeah, that just opens up so much as far as connectivity mm -hmm. between everything. So, Is it your goal to build components in Revit inside that kind of match as many tools as possible? I, I kind of assume this, this may be just a dumb question because we should assume that, but your goal is to build as many different tools into Rhino inside and Grasshopper as there are in Revit so that people can control every kind of element. I'm sure there's some limitations uh, there, but that would be, yeah, that would be thousands of, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's that, and that's where it's kind of, we need to like the people's workflows that are people are doing. So we're, we're covering a lot of the, a lot of the basics, but I don't know. The Revit API is, is incredibly complex. And then when you start getting into the particular, the, the granular of, of MEP or granular of plumbing, like, or plumbing or electrical or the mechanical ducts, uh, or even, yeah, or even the curtain wall things, uh, each path is a little different. So it's like mm. the more generalized the components can be, the better, um, uh, or else you're ended up, uh, making individual components for each, each of the separate kind of workflows. So that's where a will making it easier for people to make their own, uh, just a little tool that they could have, uh, either like with a Python or a little script that will supplement their, their particular workflow. If it's something that we can easily put in there, like, uh, uh, a component that's, that can be kind of generalized, that's, it's more likely to get added, mm -hmm. um, as a, as a native component. But, well, I don't think there's hope for this, Jeffy, but please, please build a, a stair tool and a handrail tool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nicholas Catelier from uh, Revit Pure recently posted some images on LinkedIn and uh, probably Instagram or something of like understanding stairs and understanding railings. And it's incredible how many That's pieces it. there are to, to those tools just it's kind of unfathomable. And, exactly. and those are the tools everyone hates to use because you it. never get what you want out of them. Like people who understand those tools can have a career in Revit stairs because they're that deep. So, yeah. And making that into uh, something that you could work programmically with, uh, like in a grasshopper environment, you're still kind of, you got to string to get things together. Like you're like uh, maybe because you're instead of the UI, you actually have to, figure out something, um, and code wise to make that mm -hmm. work. Right. Uh, and so that's a great example of how you'd have to make a ton of components just to get one little particular workflow that you could do really easy in a UI. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. But, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like the situation with these large projects where people, those are the ones that take 45 minutes to open then they have to go to this spot to change one thing. And like, it's, they're working in molasses probably because somebody imported a couple bad families and they don't know how they, mm -hmm. they don't have a, a clean file and everything's, but they got deadlines and everything's in, yeah, just a, a thick soup uh, where they can open Ignoring up. those warnings, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're having it where they can open up right on side Revit, have a script ready that they can push, push the button, sit there, maybe wait 30 minutes and, um, and have it do the work for them has been, uh, extremely valuable for, for a lot of people. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> you were talking about Illustrator earlier and it reminded me of a old workflow that I've, I've used and also seen a lot in school. And I think there's a lot of really interesting development and ideas uh, for how to use the software happening in the educational environment, right? Because there's no restrictions on the projects, right? It's not, and I mean, there's time restrictions, but there's no like idea restrictions. And so I, I remember this, this tool in Illustrator called Scriptographer. Have you ever heard of that? No. It, it was a way to build patterns. And so the, the workflow is basically like unfold your geometry in Rhino, uh, you know, so you're, you're flattening that out. Then you're sending, you're, you're saving that out as a, basically an illustrator readable vector file, building your pattern using scriptographer 
in Illustrator. So if you wanted, you know, variations of circles, it's stuff you can do now in, in Grasshopper. But, but back then it was way easier just to build a pattern in Illustrator, take that geometry, bring it back into Rhino, apply it across your base surface, and then using like flow along surface, pushing it up onto your building. And it was just really cool stuff like that, where I could see now if you can link these tools together and you're just streaming the data back and forth, there's some really powerful things that you can do in a tool like Illustrator that you could probably draw faster than you could come up with a graph to describe how to do that inside of Grasshopper. Maybe if you can just link these things together, I'm, I could just see some some really interesting potential happening. Well, and, and again, and like this whole I'm... idea of a Trojan horse of the rhino inside is so such a powerful idea. And, and that's where everybody's coming up with these connectors. Uh, the, the Autodesk connectors came out recently. They're still working on those. I, I helped them with some of their beta uh, demo videos uh, where they're going mm. from Rhino to Revit and using this new connector platform. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also other people developing the Rhino, different kind of Rhino connections, Rhino inside, using Rhino inside Revit to create less grasshopper uh, reliant ones, uh, like conveyor, uh, right. With Nathan Nate Miller. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, MKS beam, which is a really good one as well. And then, um, like adaptive parts environment, uh, the ape plugin, which is they, they're actually making it where your grasshopper script, um, uh, values will be sliders and Revit. Mm. Um, uh, so it takes the, the grasshopper part away and gives a, a distributable workflow that somebody uh, else in the company can use. So, that, I mean, there's there's a lot of connection going on that's uh, just besides the Rhino inside, but they're using a uh, Rhino inside as well in that, in that case. Yeah. Nate Miller was just on the podcast. His episode isn't out yet, but by the time this one's out, that one will have been out. And he, he said Rhino Inside like opened up a ton of possibilities for them to, to build tools like Conveyor that, that I, he, Conveyor was around, I think before Rhino Inside, but it was like once Rhino Inside happened, it just turbocharged what, what was possible with their tool. And yeah, we need those, uh, yeah, just for that primary reason that they're making it, uh, they're kind of, it's a little more constrained. So it's, it's telling the user, Hey, everything needs to be on these layers, mm -hmm. kind of standardization, but it makes it, uh, more distributable for the whole company versus just the, the specialists. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, absolutely. Yeah, goes as well. That's very cool. What are we missing here? What else is there uh, going on with with Rhino inside development that you want to talk about? Um, well, I think kind of getting into the where it's going um, mm -hmm. is the Rhino eight. As like I said before, uh, Grasshopper doesn't have the blocks, native block components, and all that. Uh, that's where people like the people at front made Elefront which mm -hmm. is like, yeah, it's such an amazing, like it changed everything for me. Uh, a lot of that kind of workflow uh, is getting put in natively. Elefront is still going to be relevant, uh, but there's, that's all getting added into native graphs, hopper components where you'll be able to interact uh, with Rhino a little, little easier mm. as well as, uh, what Asan's doing with the, the script editor. Uh, and these are, these are still being worked on. So, uh, definitely don't go out and download everything real right now and expect it to be right into a workflow. Uh, but that's going to have a big impact on the Rhino inside Revit as far as, uh, expanding, making the workflows easier, getting it where, where you can share these, um, your grasshopper scripts with other people, uh, package them up, um, just send it, send it one file over to a user that that's going to have all the, all the dependencies, uh, say if you're using a, a Elefront plugin or Puckerfish or one of the other crazy named plugins that it's going to take it with it and people can share it. Cause currently that's, that's not really a, a feasible workflow without 
education. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. Oh, so that's, that's going to change everything. And that's where my focus is uh, going to be learning and helping uh, on the, the development of those tools because that's, um, it's going to take, they're still being worked on. And then it's also going to educate people how to, how that workflow, uh, it's going to work. So. Mm. Awesome. I, I, I'm thrilled with the work that's come out of this. It's just, it's an incredible thing. I, not enough people know about it. So I'm glad you're talking about it here on this show. I think there's a lot of people who maybe even think that, it's just opening up Pandora's box and they don't want to get into it because they've got project deadlines. But I mean, is there anywhere people can go to kind of get an introduction to Rhino inside that exists on the McNeil site somewhere or where's the best place to learn about this kind of stuff? Um, if you just, if you Google Rhino inside Revit, um, the Rhino inside Revit, uh, main landing page will be hopefully the first result which is going to be the Rhino Inside Revit guide. And this was initially put together by um, Asan and Scott and the team. So some of it's a little older. I've been adding on to it as, a, as we go. That is going to give you more about, you're going to learn more about Revit than you ever wanted to know. Uh, <laughs> because that, <laughs> that kind of breaks down like how Revit works. Um, so that's where getting uh, getting into the guide seeing seeing what's possible uh seeing how revit works on a on a programming level that revit api uh, and how that relates to our components um is it's pretty oh yeah it's you're gonna learn a lot if you don't know about revit uh, if you don't um aren't from as familiar with grasshopper that's a that's a different story uh there's a lot of there's a lot of educators out there now trying to do grasshopper classes. Uh, like I said, the one issue is kind of when people say gra- think of grasshopper, especially in the architecture world, they immediately think of like some wavy shell shape that that's being panelized, and that's and that's what a lot of the tutorials are geared to. But there there's also a very very pragmatic side to grasshopper. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and that's something I'm trying to figure out how to uh, teach people more, more mm-hmm. of, and kind of get that kind of workflow where, no, you don't have to have a, a big spaghetti, massive, one single grasshopper definition. You can have a, a bunch of small things that that do really partic- particular workflows that uh, aren't too difficult to go back into five months later and understand. Right. I, like if I do a big definition going back three months later, it's, I have to sit there and figure out what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Getting it where, um, uh, yeah, the kind of more, uh, people understand grasshopper, not only for that complex computational design, but more of a kind of a computational drafter, um, uh, situation, which is going to tie right into Revit and Rhino. So. Brian Ringley, he's been on the show a couple of times. I remember at, I think it was an AU, so Autodesk University class back a a long time ago, 2016, 2017, something like that. A long time ago. He He works um, with the robot. Robots? He works at Boston Dynamics now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And he had he was a, a big time grasshopper user. He was at Woods Bagot and we work uh, with Andrew Human as well. And he had a slide in one of his presentations. It was like what people think grasshopper is good at. And it was like making weird shapes, right? And then it was like the list of what what it's actually good at. And it it was like a lot of really practical things. And then at the very end, it was making weird shapes fabricatable, right? So the thing <laughs> that you actually used it for when when you were doing your metal panel work before. Um, and, and so there is that perception for sure. And and that exists. And it's it's hardcore because it's probably instilled starting in the educational side and it works its way up from there all the way through corporate leadership and in, in large architectural firms. So yeah, it is good at that. And and at the same time, like that is what it's perceived as doing. And it's also good at so many other things. There's so much low hanging fruit when it comes to 
building a grasshopper script that just does something that you should not do anymore, uh, you know, is like manually. I mean, just automate it with a grasshopper script. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, there was something I wanted to ask you about um, just the relationship with Autodesk. You said that they've got these new data connectors and, the, and that's, I might, I don't fully, haven't fully read through what that's all about. Maybe you could explain what those are and then just talk about what that working relationship has been like. Because I, I think in the past, or at least the perception even with that is that it's a little adversarial or was adversarial because, um, you know, these are competing at some level, but at the same time, it's like different tools for the job, the best tool for the job, a workflow. There's all of these other things at play in the profession. So maybe you can just speak to what's going on there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, we, we, uh, they let us go to a Autodesk university last year. Uh, so we had a booth. Uh, they was, let, <laughs> I like how you stated that they let us there. <laughs> well, they, yeah. well I, I know they didn't let test fit in last year. Um, Correct. Right. Right. Um, I heard but that. Test well. fits back in the, back in the, the, the good graces. So essentially right. we're in a good relationship. Uh, yeah. With the development teams, uh, there's, uh, if they have any questions, they, they, they contact us. We have questions, we contact them. It's um, not a big issue. Uh, I think where the, where it could go off the rails is if some of their the upper management sees a, as a threat of some sort, um, yeah. and then they just kind of cut everybody off. Mm -hmm. uh, but the relationship at a, like the developer level and their, and their people is great. Uh, the, the, the connector, we're going to Autodesk University again this year as well. Um, the connectors are, they're still pretty early. So right now they, they're they kind of getting the APS, they're the parameter service. So the goal, I, the way I see their big, the big goal is the, I think it's called MID, uh, Manufacturer Informed Design. Uh, that's going to be their four JPI, which will connect their like inventor with um, a man. Uh, somebody who's making, we'll say, chairs. Mm -hmm. Can put a chair, can come up with a chair specification that has a certain amount of flexibility. Uh, the Revit family would be created off of that specification. The inventor would also be able to use that work when the manufacturer change their uh their design or or change something that that does that change would flow through to wherever products they're going to i think that's the the overall goal uh and the the connectors are kind of a, a big part of that with their parameter service so that's where they're trying to make it so that you can take because even talking back and forth in between autodesk products can be an issue <laughs> Hmm. Uh, they're trying to get those where they can have a, a parameter. It means height and Revit can mean height and hmm. uh, inventor. And it would actually come as a user text in Rhino that would say height hmm. uh, and be able to go back and forth with that information. Uh, the geometry is pretty limited. Uh, they're essentially just shooting out uh, direct shapes, kind of like, for instance, a wall, um, a wall, Revit wall has multiple layers. You know, you could have your sure. at high level detail. You could have multiple materials and multiple layers on that wall. Mm -hmm. When they, their connector is pretty much just going to be a flat box with some material, like some the, the top level properties. So it's right. not very granular. It's not very edible, but they are getting uh, specific geometry back and forth uh, between. So I think working on a large kind of connect uh, BIM coordination level where, where they're trying to communicate with subcontractors that only need a little chunk of the building. They don't have Revit maybe, or they don't, like, they don't have the whole suite. They're not uh, proficient. They can just send them a little chunk of the model uh, that they could open up uh, and be able to update that in their in the, the Autodesk construction cloud. So hmm. um, how that relationship is going to continue to evolve uh, is pretty much going to be up to them. Uh, 
we're we're not a threat. We're not a, a BIM software. We're not necessarily um, huge or um, in those markets. So it's um, yeah, as long as as long as they'll have us around, we'll we'll show up. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested to see how that develops as well. Uh, and, and just to bring it back to Rhino and the version 8, I've been using version 8 WIP quite a bit. And man, it's for architects. I just want to put a, a plug out there. The tools that are coming into Rhino 8 for architects specifically, just with the push-pull stuff. I mean, and I would also say the rendering uh, as well is beautiful it's absolutely wonderful work and it's so great it's like this is like one of those times where i actually want to say finally like this, these tools are here they're amazing they're absolutely uh, just a, a true joy to use i can't imagine using an older version once this comes out it's going to be a game changer for architects well, at the most basic level of just building models well and and Rhino is such a uh, used in such a variety of industries, right? Yeah. So it's and we don't make it so you have to upgrade. So if if right. somebody has a process that's working in Rhino five, uh, as long as the computer is going to support the software, because we're not making any updates to Windows twelve or thirteen, it's, they'll be able to continue to do that process. Uh, and so with Rhino eight, it's probably going to come out here in the next couple of months. Uh, there's, it's still like the core Rhino is really getting really solid. I got mm -hmm. the, like you said, the cycles renderings in there, the push pull, all that. Um, some of the peripher peripheral things such as Rhino inside Revit, um, and the, some of the grasshopper stuff is still going to be an ongoing development, uh, cause as, as we get more users, um, so that. That's going to be a, there's going to be definitely a little bit of growing pains there in the first couple of months. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to be giving a couple of workshops, uh, one in Chicago in October and then, uh, and then New York for the AEC tech, uh, I'm trying to introduce some of that, um, to some of the hardcore users. Nice. Um, and that'll be my first kind of real test of, <laughs> of the new workflows. So. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really excited about version eight and the, and the tools that are coming just again, just to build models uh, and not, not even talking about the grasshopper side of things, which I know is get, getting better as well. Uh, I, I'm thrilled and, and I'm even using it on a Mac. So the user interface kind of parity with windows are getting closer at least. Uh, and the stuff that that's going on there is is really really great and the native graphics support for the metal uh, apis on on the m1 or m2 max is it's great i mean i'm using it on a, on a tiny laptop and it, it just flies it's really fast so it's and, it's a, and that was tough to support to with this like on the rhino 7 because we knew the rhino 8 was going to be totally native on the mac and like so it's like having to tell rhino 7 users are like hey i've got this big massive model and it's really sluggish and it's, mm -hmm. it's not performing it's like oh it's it's coming soon it's coming soon so, <laughs> so now now we finally have a really really good um mac the best mac environment possible uh yeah. going with rhino so that 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 is exciting that's cool and yeah mcneil mcneil's a little different so it's like we don't do any like mar real marketing or or anything like that it's it's up to the users to to talk about it so that's um having having uh things that people can brag about uh such as that performance or the new features is great so yeah absolutely well i'll put links to everything that we've talked about in this i'll put link to follow you on linkedin and wherever else people can find is there is there anything else that we've missed here in this conversation no uh no we did uh didn't have to talk about AI or anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's things that were intentionally left out of this conversation. <laughs> no. The, uh, uh, no, uh, just it's all built on user input, user questions, user requests. So asking, uh, asking questions, uh, especially in the Rhino inside Revit, uh, that's where I learn. That's how I learn is like, yeah, solving 
solving problems that normally I wouldn't have to solve. Um, cause, uh, that, and that, so we rely on those, that input from people. So anybody has any questions, they could reach out to me, either message me privately, uh, on the forum or, or where, wherever you find me. So great. Well, Jaffe, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been great. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, I wouldn't mind uh, coming back in maybe a year and see where it's going to be a lot different, I think. And once Rhino waits out for a solid year and Rhino inside Revit, um, it's going to look different. So, nice. So we should talk All right. Again. Let's do it. All right. Cool. Thanks.